Well, good morning. This is Sunday Brunch. I'm Chris McCarthy. We're here on WBSM. Thanks to Mike Berry, who, who um, came in and, and talked Republican, Republican stuff with us. Now we have a friend of the show, uh, and of course uh, everyone knows him, the Sunday editor of the New Bedford Standard Times, Jack Spillane. Thanks for coming in, Jack. Also a friend of Chris. Yes, yep. that's right. And so we had an interesting election just went by this past Tuesday. Um, I know it's, boy, it's weird, though, right? It almost seems like it was a month ago now. Well, yeah, it, 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 it's funny about elections sometimes. Sometimes they don't go away, like right. Bush in 2000 or, or Trump uh, last year. Right. And sometimes they go away right away. <laughs> I know, I know. And and not a, not a lot of surprises, I don't think, in the, in the city oh, election. I think the four-year. But the four-year thing. Oh, no, yeah. that's a whole separate thing. I, and I, I've been eating my humble pie. I couldn't believe it. On the, we, we were doing it live here on the radio Tuesday night. To a person, we were all shocked that it, that yeah. it, that, that it, that it won. I thought it was going to go down big time. Yeah. So I was doing it live with Peter Bonney right. um, on Facebook Live, and um, uh, we were shocked. Uh, I thought it might win narrowly, mm-hmm. but I did never think it would be a, a 6% you know, clear victory. Right. Um, uh, I vote in New Bedford, and mm-hmm. the ballot question was very simple. And I think simple ballot questions might confuse people. It said, do you support a four-year term in New Bedford? Well, I think... There are three kinds of voters. Yes. There are voters who are very well informed, who follow everything. Yes. There are voters who talk to their friends and their family and vote that way. Right. And then there are voters who don't know a thing. Nothing. <laughs> like, Not know? a thing. And I'm not sure why they go except that somebody said, you're voting, and they go down. Right. No, no, I, I, know, I know. I know. And look, we, we have a bad history of uh, in this country in certain parts of restricting voter rights and things like that. But – Sometimes, I don't know, maybe, maybe we ought to... So, I think there it. may have been uh, the voters who don't know a thing uh, category out there. Also, I think it may have been a little stronger than people, uh, because there, there is a good argument for it. I, I supported yeah. it. Um, uh, so, uh, it was very interesting. New Bedford Forward, which sponsored it, right. did not do any advertising. None. Did not do any campaign for it. A little bit of sign holding, fact, all I saw. Even, even Victor Pinero, a very well-respected guy in the city, when he came in to our editorial board, he said, well... We're just putting it on the table, and you know you guys can discuss it. Right. And, you know, um, uh, so uh, but there were some uh, heavy hitters. John Mackey Jr. is certainly a well-respected yes. uh, person in the city, um, and uh, Rick Kidder, the head of the right. Chamber of Commerce. And they had people like John Fletcher from the school John committee. Fletcher. You had a lot of they they that committee was was good in the way that they, they were broad based, yeah. I think, um, and deep roots, and. They also do a Democratic. I mean, yeah. rather than saying, hey, city council, you guys do it, which was one of the other ways to do it. They brought it to the people. I think we all could have done a better job discussing it. But, you know, the changes to it, as, as you point out, it's a simply worded question. Yeah, I hadn't known it till the day after when um, Mayor Mitchell was on, whose show was it? It, it was, uh, I think it was uh, Brian Thomas. Okay. And he said... Um, yeah, this is law now. This is there's no role for the city council or anything. I didn't know that. Right. Number two, um, some time ago, the state legislature enacted a law where it could be done by referendum, just like that. You don't okay. have to go back to the legislature, and um, uh, uh, nineteen cities had done it since then. Okay. So uh, evidently, this is something that the state is trying to encourage, uh, and so it, it went through. I I, I I do think it's a defeat for Scott Lang. Uh, yeah. I I can't remember anybody being out there the way he was. Right. Uh, I'm I'm sure he thought he it was almost like a proxy campaign for mayor. Uh, you know, you had uh, Ty Perry running, and then you had the four year term running, and uh, Lang did not take a position on the the um, mayoral thing. And in fact, he Correct. came pretty close to uh, siding with Mitchell, uh, holding his nose. I guess uh, he uh, he said that. Um, uh, on our editorial, uh, 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 my interview with him, he said, "I want to be unequivocal that I support Chief Joe Cordero." Well, he couldn't really say that because that was a, a big part of the the Perry campaign. Certainly, certainly, like, uh, so. it was it. So you had th- three mayors because you're, you're you know Mike Bonner in your paper. You guys did a great job on that story. You had three pay- mayors who were for it, uh, no against it, Tierney. Bullard, Lang, two ex- sitting, two former, well, one sitting mayor Mitchell and, and Fred Kalis, who were 
who are for making a four year right. term. And the interesting thing, I think, was John Bullard, because uh, John Bullard is usually seen as kind of a limousine liberal, a progressive type guy. I like right. John Bullard yeah. a lot. I hope he's not offended by me using that term, but. Uh, he, he's seen as a progressive type. And Probably looking at his driveway wondering where that limousine is, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's out in Westport now, so I don't know that the driveway is a, it might be a long one. Right. <laughs> like, you know, but uh, uh, so uh, John unequivocally came out in support of the two-year term. I thought that was surprising. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that is. I, I think there might be some bad blood in terms of fisheries issues. Okay. And, and, and the mayor, John, um, is an environmentalist. He yes. is on the um, – uh, uh, Fisheries Management Council, but he has pointed out some legitimate issues that don't go down easily in mm -hmm. the city of New Bedford right. um, on environmental, um, the, the legitimate concerns about the fishery. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so whatever, he, he came out. So that was three and two. Right. Uh, but but really, it was Scott Lang that, that was um, leading yeah. the charge. Scott was very much against, very vocal. We had him here on the program. Um, of course, we had, you know, they had, they had other people on other shows as well, you know, um, who were for it. Barry Richard, for instance, Kittens, was for it. I was, I guess, I don't live in the city of New yeah. Bedford, but I do believe that the way the city of New Bedford goes, so goes the region. Yeah. And I think it's an important change. My big thing was not letting the city council wait out the mayor, because you can wait out a mayor for a year. Right. You know, when you, and, and you can hold something up and yes. think, you know, something else might change. It's very hard to wait a mayor out for, for, for three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that. Well, first of all, had Scott Lang not come forward and brought this thing up, I don't even know there would have been any discussion and on it, it, really. And it probably would have went bigger. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Of course, he, you know, he, he did a small advertising campaign here on the radio. He was out talking to people. You guys, ha he was in the paper. Um, but it, it was, it, look, I, I will say this for me. I thought the thing was going to win go down overwhelmingly yeah I, everybody i talked to in the city thought it would would, would uh be defeated mm -hmm. i didn't talk to a single person who thought it would be defeated but it reminded me a little bit of when john mitchell beat linda morad at that time i could not find a single person that didn't think morad right was going to get into the final some people thought tony would get in th some people thought mitchell would get in but nobody had her left out and right. she was the one that was left out so totally it, it's hard agree. to predict the voters uh, sometimes i the never other, make a prediction jack the other surprise i thought was john olivera uh, getting through in the school committee yeah. race um uh, what do you attribute? What do you attribute that now, to? I've heard some discussion. There may have been some confusion with Bruce Oliveira, who yeah. is uh, an incumbent and more of a um, moderate, uh, mm -hmm. shall we say, on um, school committee issues. Um, but on the other hand, um, it's sort of like the four-year term. John took a clear stand. I mean, you might have had some doubts with Josh Amaral because he does try to. I think Josh is more of a, a politician type. He tries to yeah. to build consensus on both sides. Um, same with Colleen DeWicky, uh, although she was clearly a progressive. Um, uh, Rick Porter was clearly a teachers union uh, candidate. Yep. I, I thought the teachers union had some muscle there. I right. really thought it was between DeWicky and Oliveira yep. uh, for not getting through. And a lot of people I talked to right. uh, thought that. Although I, I, I thought Porter was going to do well because he had an apple on his sign. <laughs> and do you know, if you're running for school committee, you got to have an apple, right? Isn't Those are the best signs of the campaign. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> so if you ever see an apple, like, oh, that guy must be running for something related to the school or that yeah. woman. Yeah. Tom Hunt, a real smart uh, political guy right. around town, uh, has said to me, he thought that Rick could come in first. He thought he could come in fourth. Mm -hmm. he, he, Tom is an ex-school committee guy, right. finding it very difficult, he thought, to predict that campaign. What I, I agree, first of all, Oliver is a great name in New Bedford for politics. Bruce has done a nice, yeah. thing, nice, nice job. People really like Bruce. Yeah. Uh, of course, I think John is, no, is well known to a lot of people more than sometimes you, know, you just never know right you never know who people know and he, he has kids in the school he's active in activities um he's you know he's been around a while well, he's a former pr guy right. uh for the air force and mm -hmm. uh, uh he was quoted in the newspaper the navy i think uh navy yeah. uh, uh before he uh ever left the um the service right. so uh he was a, i remember 10 15 years ago he was around uh, he was oh, active yeah. in issues and he doesn't look like the same guy though no, he does not. I remember when he was a clean cut. <laughs> he was a Navy guy. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I like John. He's a regular listener to the call. In fact, boy, I'll tell you one of the things that I miss is you get all these guys who run for office and then they can't come in the studio and I, they, can't, I can't, they can't call here. And so oh, I've missed him, you know, because he, right. he was a regular caller here. Because uh, he's active in the marijuana, uh, the oh, pro-marijuana thing. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah how he does has, he come down on that? Oh, he's in favor of it. He okay. grows his own marijuana. Okay. I know, I know, I know. You voters just learned something you didn't know, <laughs> but, but he's been very over, outspoken about it. He yeah. t he started telling me about it. He's got a medical marijuana card. He started telling me about it way back when we were having a discussion about 
the dispensary, and they were yeah. signing the agreement on Hathaway Road, and so he was in favor of that. We were talking about it. He's telling me he was growing his own uh, at home. So You might be surprised at the people who grow marijuana. Uh, I know a few people that uh, I think people would be surprised. <laughs> I think you – yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be, but but I know what you're saying. I think be, be yeah. Hey, so I right, check. So on the mayor's race side, did John Mitchell comes in with a with a con- convincing return? Ultimately, he had a little problem in the primary. Oh yeah, that but- w- was was strange. Well, th- this really saved any uh, statewide career John Mitchell hopes to have because a twenty point win is a twenty point win, right. and. Um, uh, there were people going around saying if he wins by 1%, 2%, he's finished statewide. Of course. And I, yeah. and I think he would have been. Um, I think that uh, – I think he would have done better in the primary if he had if he had done some work. Oh, I totally agree um, with you. So, Miscalculation on his on – yeah, part of his team. Yeah, and it, it appears Charlie Sealing was the primary. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, Mitchell took him for granted, I think that's mm-hmm. fair to say. I think he might acknowledge that himself. Um, at his victory party, he said um, – I almost didn't make the playoffs. Right. Uh, so, I mean, because if he had somehow lost that primary, come in second to that, in that primary to Charlie, right. wow, then it would have been even more of an intense uh, a race. Uh, Absolutely. And I think Charlie Perry um, benefited. This isn't to take anything away from him, but he benefited from the fact that he had a very competitive primary in Ward 4, mm-hmm. which is you know the largest Cape Verdean section of the city. Uh, both JoJo and... Uh, uh, Dana Ribeiro. Dana Ribeiro and, and the gentleman whose names keep escaping, but the retired guy from the Marine Corps in the primary. Kenny Gilbert. Kenny, thank you. Kenny Gilbert. They all brought out a big vote. And just like Irish people mm-hmm. vote for the Irish candidate, a lot of them, the Cape Verdean community is going to be a natural pride. I don't think it, it wasn't a reflection on John Mitchell. It's just a reality. You say, hey, that guy's like me. I'm voting for him. When I came to New Bedford, I looked for an Irish dentist. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. Actually, Dr. I, I Muldoon? Didn't, d- d- didn't so much look for an Irish dentist as I got the list of names and the one that was the Irish guy, I thought, well, you know, I, I, yeah. know, the, I know what the Irish are about. Right. No, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, my pediatrician was Dr. Downey. Um, good guy. He's passed away now. But uh, So I think Charlie Perry, I think that the Mitchell campaign, and we discussed it ad nauseum, they they did take the, him for granted, and they didn't calculate that you're going to have a big turnout in four, which then made him, which gave Charlie Perry a bigger vote and made him look uh, – you know, stronger than ultimately. And was. there was some. There was a big piece of news that came out in the interim after the primary, oh. and that was Charlie Perry's MCAD complaint, which uh, Charlie feels very uh, sincerely about. That mm-hmm. uh, I, I, you know, the kind of guy that Charlie Perry is, you can't imagine him uh, filing that if he didn't feel sincerely about it. Right. Uh, on the other hand, it was a complaint that there was very little evidence for, and I think a lot of people thought. Who, well, who is this guy that would file such right. a complaint against Chief Joe Cordero, right. a very popular police chief? Uh, yeah, that was a very unfortunate, very in- interesting timing that that lawsuit. <laughs> very interesting <laughs> timing. Relief. Timing uh, that it the, that the MCAD decided just before the, the primary. You don't like to think of MCAD as being politically influenced, but I no. I would not be surprised if they no. were. Never, it wouldn't happen, Jack. Um, you know, it's Ward Four. What do you think? I thought JoJo was going to win that race. You know, I didn't. Um, you didn't. Okay. I thought he was going to win last time, two years ago. All right. Uh, uh, you know, Ward 4 is a little bit like Ward 1. Sometimes it can be hard to figure out. Uh, in the 18 years I've been here, it's gone back and forth between JoJo, um, Bruce Stewart. Mm-hmm. Um, Dana has now come in lately. Uh, it's always close. Uh, but I think that um, the, the JoJo, it's been 10 years since JoJo was a, a city councilor because people forget that before Dana, uh, Bruce Stewart was That's in right. for uh, four years, maybe eight years, but a long time since JoJo right. was in. And... Um, he had uh, he had lost to Bruce, and then he lost to Dana. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I mean, it reminds me a little bit of George Rogers, who had his following at one time. Right. And when I saw, I really thought that uh, Dana had some weaknesses as both a, yeah. a counselor as a candidate, right. and that JoJo was close last time, not as close as this time in the right. primary. But the primary, I think, uh, Charlie brought people out, JoJo brought people out, but three votes. That's where he came, you right. know, and. Um, and he dropped back a little bit yes. in the in the final, uh, a little bit like Mitchell. She may have woken up. Uh, I know that Molly and Pollock's group, um, uh, Coalition for Social Justice, is yeah, a big supporter of, the names. of Dana. And they got out uh, their mailing list, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the, it's Russian interference. The, um, <laughs> you said that. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, no, it, look, I, I, I like Jojo Force quite a bit. I, you know, I like him, too. It goes back to... 
and you had that in the paper about it. You, you know, he is a he is a good guy. Well, I wrote a yeah, column one time yeah. uh, where I was at a Gomes debate. It, it man, very late, and um, my car was was way down in a, in a tough section. Uh, uh, they almost to Roberto Clemente Park, and he said, "You're not walking down there." And he uh, uh, he walked with me. Yeah, okay, so that's the kind of guy Jojo is. He really is a good guy. He goes back to my father had him as a student at New Bedford High School years ago. You know, my father always thought the world of him way back. Anyway, so we now have additional women on the city council. I thought that that was an, an, an interesting development that you, we've now got an, uh, even more women on the on on the. We have one more. Is it one more? Right. Because uh, uh, Costa Costa lost in Ward One. Right. Uh, a race that I, I did think that Brad Markey would come in, come through, and win that race. Right. Uh, but Giesta, Maria Giesta, Giesta, who will be a, a force Absolutely. on the council. Absolutely. And um, and then you have a bunch coming back. Uh, you have yeah. Koala and Carney and Morad, three of the at large. Three of the five at large councils are women, right? And so that's four, and then you have Dana. Dana. So you have five, I think you have five. So it's all, it's just a slim minority of, uh, of women now in the council. Yeah, yeah, and and I th- I think you're right. I mean I think Maria Giesta is going to uh, be a, be an interesting and, and and good city yeah. council. I mean she brings a lot to the table. Yeah, she she knows politics. Right. Uh, she will know how to count votes, yep. and she will. I think if she watched Bonnie Frank all those years, she'll know how to make deals. Mm-hmm. Um, whether she'll make deals is the question. Um, in our editorial, we endorsed her. We thought she was the stronger candidate, but we also strongly recommended that she um, not carry grudges about the mayor and that she judge right. every issue on the issues and work with him when she can, yep. oppose him when she disagrees. That's right. Uh, I think um, I'm a fan of Linda Morad's, but I think she's been a little bit reflexive in her attitude towards um uh, Mitchell, and yep. I hope that we do her again this year, but I hope yeah. she gets a little bit less so. Uh, it, it, it's a, uh, she, you know, she's got a good resume f- for the job. She knows what she's doing. Also, it's a, it's a, she's smart to have come back. I mean, she ran for mayor. It's tough being an incumbent mayor. Um, she made an argument for it. I, I, know she, I think her mom was sick, too, at the yeah. time. So, you know, there's some things that popped up. But she came back, which yeah. is all, which is the important thing. Well, I thought she should have run for council to begin with because mm-hmm. she had the resume, uh, and she had good issues. I thought it was hard to be away from New Bedford for thirty years and come back in the first year you're back, run for mayor. Yes, it, it just seemed a little presumptuous to me. Uh, uh, she was a good candidate, I thought. She made some mistakes. Uh, I'm told that this race, Steve Martin's approached her, and um, uh, I think that's true. I, I probably should. I'm not exactly sure it's true, but I'm, I was told yeah. that, that he did. Um, uh, he uh, uh, that will give good representation to the ward. Yes. Um, I think uh, the ward is um, split now. The northern portion of the ward is more Portuguese, and the southern portion more Latino. Right, and it's going to be interesting to see. Um, Edwin Cartagena, I think, could be a force in New Bedford mm-hmm. politics to come. We have not really seen the Latino community mobilized yet. There was a, a guy in the school committee who was appointed for a while, and then he disappeared shortly after. Uh, I can't even remember his name, uh, but uh, a ground up. Edward Cartagena is the first ground up Latino uh, right. candidate that I've seen. And um, he was down in Puerto Rico for mm-hmm. a, a big portion of the campaign. I'm sure that hurt him, but I'm sure there was no question that he was going to do it. Right. Uh, uh, so we'll, we'll see uh, what happens. If I was Maria Jester, I would um, build bridges to Edward Cartagena. I think, Jack, that well, you had, you, you know, you had a lot of candidates that you hope come back. Maybe not for the job that they ran for this time, yeah. but there's a good quality yeah. group of people. A lot, of good, a lot of good people. Paul Chase in Ward yep. 5 I thought was a, a quality candidate. Melissa Costa in Ward 1, right. another quality candidate. Um, knows Ward races only one person can win. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And good morning, or what's left of it. Um, we have Jack Spillane here in the studio discussing uh, local politics, what happened on Tuesday. Now, so what happened on Tuesday is John Mitchell had a big win, 20 points? 20 points, uh, just over 20 points. And while it's not fair to do to him, we, we don't really care. He's got broad shoulders and thick skin. Let's speculate on his future. Well, we, we do care, but it won't stop us. Well, it's, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It won't stop us. The Okay, look, John Mitchell's name has popped up a, around people. If you talk to people outside of the area, as you do and I do, people who are involved in politics, his name comes up as, as, as a potential statewide candidate or it potential does. congressional candidate. It does. He works the uh, Boston media quite a bit. Yep. He, uh, a lot of um, stories in places like Boston Magazine, right. Boston Globe uh, over the last six years. Um, right. uh, he's an ambitious guy. He right. clearly, I think, would look at races like attorney general, lieutenant governor. I, I don't think he would 
think of himself as going directly to governor because I, I, I just think it's hard to do that from southeastern Mass. Yes. I think the last governor was Governor Morton of Freetown. <laughs> okay. And when was that? <laughs> oh, one time. I long time ago. Um, so he's, you know, he, you can see him for attorney general. First of all, of course, Baker's the, the guy. If Baker's, if everything goes according to Baker's plan and according to the way it looks, which oftentimes mm-hmm. it doesn't, but Baker's reelected, which means running for lieutenant governor, which is one of the places people speculated Mitchell may be a candidate, lieutenant governor on the Democrat side, would be useless, perhaps. Uh, but well, I what think if, it would be useful because he gets his name out there. That's right. a race that he doesn't mind losing because his name, his name is not the He's top, the top of, the, of the, ticket. the ticket. He gets his name out there. Yep. People don't hold him as accountable as the loser. Right. Uh, Charlie Baker is a prohibitive f- favorite to, to win re-election. I think he's the most popular governor in the country. He is, yeah. Uh, so, but, but from Mitchell's perspective— Of course, so was George H.W. Bush at one time. Exactly. You know what I mean? You never know. Exactly. Would anyone have thought— would you, you know, there's so many things that can happen— I don't think they're going to happen, but then again, I thought George H.W. Bush was going to be elected, and this guy from Arkansas beat him. Yeah. So you never know. You don't know. Ed Muskie was the prohibitive favorite to be uh, to get the Democratic nomination for president, George McGovern. Uh, That's right. That's uh, right. Got it. So if if uh, Maura Healy is, is apparently staying out of the governor's race, but if she decided suddenly to get in because she saw some vulnerability on Baker's side, then you'd have a mad rush to the door for Democrats running for attorney right. general. Right, and I think it's fair to say Mitchell will not run for attorney general against if Mara Healy is in office. Correct. He wouldn't primary her. Be no hope of that. Problem becomes, if you're John Mitchell and you run for lieutenant governor, you lose, then two, a year from now, after losing for, a year from then, after losing for lieutenant governor, he has to make a decision. Is he out or is he run again for mayor? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And so then, then he has to go back to, the, does he just say to stay in, go back to the people, say, you know, I still want to be mayor even though I wanted to leave and be lieutenant governor. Yeah. Of course, none of, of course, none of this is fair to do to John Mitchell. Well, it's fair because it's politics. Well, but. I mean, he's a politician. He's put himself forward. And he, he has and, put himself and, forward. And he and, also has $600,000 in his uh, campaign committee, which is not a small amount of money. No. It's certainly more than you need for a New Bedford mayor's race. So. Uh, no, no. It's absolutely. Of course, look, I can remember when my friend Mark Montigny, we all thought he was going to run statewide. He had a million. He still has a million dollars in the bank. Um, I don't think he's going to run statewide now. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. we're going to we're going to take a break here for the for the national and the local news and we'll come back in the next hour. I'm Chris McCarthy, this is Sunday brunch. We're going to be here till about 1230, at which point the NFL will crash through and take over the station, and I'll be out the door. We have Jack Splane in the studio. Just keep keep in mind that, that at about uh, 1220, right before the game, we'll have John Sapacchetti calling in, as he always does every week, to give us his football picks uh, for, uh, for today and tonight and tomorrow, and I think we'll even get to Thursday um, as well. So we're going to continue our conversation about the local stuff, and now we're doing the, the, the fun thing of speculating on John Mitchell. We've been here before with Mark Montigny as a potential statewide candidate. Scott Lang's name has been mentioned in, in the past. If you read uh, Globe still articles, st- he's still mentioned, still absolutely mentioned, and there may be something there, uh, but we'll see. You've got some opportunities in Massachusetts coming up, and by that I mean Ed Markey is getting along. He's in his 80s. <laughs> he is not. Ed Markey? Ed Markey? Isn't he? No. <laughs> no, I think... How old is he then? Senator Markey? Yeah. Uh, is he in his 70s, maybe? Yeah, I think I, he'll be 80 when it, when he's up for re-election. Wow, that's just astonishing. I, I He goes I, back to McGee and Kavarian in the house. Yeah. Remember he had his uh, desk out in the... Out in the in the state, he's been there a while. Been there uh, a I long mean, time. I mean, Liz Warren is also older than you might think. She's yeah. in her late sixties, I think. Uh, yeah, she's. Gonna, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, look, she, you know, we, just, we live longer. Yeah, Ed Mar- Senator Markey is is I think. It, well, the reason you don't know, you don't, is because he's <laughs> never around, Jack. Well, there's that. Um, he, he doesn't live here. Born July eleventh, nineteen forty six. So. I understood there'd be no math this morning. <laughs> there'd be no math. <laughs> there'd be no math here well, this morning. Usually, Wikipedia gives the age, right? I'm, right. They're, they're not like uh, so. Well, all right. I'm, I was also, born. In, I was his eighties because I'm born in fifty two. So, and if he's born in forty six, that means he's six years older than me. He's seventy one. All right. Okay. Okay. So he's not quite. He's not in his eighties. I gave him some. <laughs> I, do, I made him more distinguished than he was. Uh, but 
look, is he the is he a strong can is he potential is there a potential to in the Democrat primary to take him on? Oh, I think yeah. there is. I think Ed Markey has always been a weak candidate. Uh uh much more vulnerable incumbent than Liz Warren because there are nat- national interests that mm-hmm. will will fight to preserve Liz Warren, although she could be a little bit vulnerable too. But Ed uh was sort of like the last man standing in survivor mm-hmm. uh in the Democratic primary when he won the Senate right. uh, race. Now he has a uh, Strong ties to environmental groups and things like that that will mm-hmm. help him raise money. He's sort of a um, uh, uh, nondescript senator, almost like uh, Bob Cazera on a on a, a statewide level. Right, uh, right. And I like Bob Cazera. No, I like Bob I, too I quite a bit. I don't know Ed Markey. Uh, I, I think I'm. You know, I'm a dem- well. I'm not a Democrat, but I, for all intents and purposes, I may as well be. I'm a progressive. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I he. By the way, I think Bob Cazero works harder than, than than Senator Markey. As I sit here thinking about it, I don't. I don't get that impression. I I, no? I just I just get the impression that Markey is is interested in big issues like you know uh, telecommunications, uh, environment, things like that, and uh, you know so he's been there in those big issues. Is he? Uh, he must do some constituent services. I, I he sent me I a think, piece of franked that. mail recently for those yeah. people. Who aren't familiar with that term? It's it's the when they it's not campaign literature. It looks just like it, but yeah. the government pays for it to be printed and to get sent to your house. They sign, they sign it. That's their stamp yeah. on the fishing industry, and it it and it went to every house in the in in the district. I down here, I believe. Very nice piece of mailing, as you would expect it's from his office, not his campaign. No, from his wow. office, but it's from his campaign. Let's yeah. be honest, right? So, is that something that John Mitchell might look at? That U.S. Senate seat, I think he would. I, I, I think both him and Scott Lang. I think Scott Lang would, as well. Look at it. Um, Scott Lang has been talking a lot about um, his dissatisfaction with the Democratic Party. Yes, uh, and uh, he uh, feels that the um, uh, pr- uh, pr- primary, not the actual voting, was right. rigged, but the um, rules process. Oh, yeah. that by which the uh, the Democrats governed their primaries was rigged, and I think that's what Donna Brazil actually means too. She doesn't mean the actual voting. Um, uh, right, and uh, so I think that, that, that Scott thinks the Democratic Party needs some reform, and uh, he might see that as a vehicle he could get it. I think John Mitchell is an ambitious guy mm-hmm. that he would look at Senate, he would look at Congress. Uh, I don't think he would look at state Senate anymore, um, uh, yeah. uh, as he once did. Uh, right. uh, but uh, we'll see. I think he also uh, would look at statewide office, Mitchell. Yeah, I think that, I think that John Mitchell. Uh, we'll we'll look look at that, seeing if there's any opportunities. It's just it almost seems like things are frozen in time here because Baker is so popular. So you know you don't have a lot of people moving. I mean you have Seti Warren running, but he was leaving the Newton uh, mayor's seat anyway. He's running. You have Jay Gonzalez. I think they're both nice guys. I think they're both smart, but I don't think they're going to knock out Charlie Baker. So. Let's look at Mitchell's track record. He has a track record of challenging people who are better known than him. Yes. Uh, he ran for mayor when he was an assistant U.S. attorney, largely unknown in the city. Certainly. Uh, he got some uh, favorable uh, press coverage because he did have qualifications. Yeah. But um, he beat uh, 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 State Rep. Tony Cabral and uh, City Councilor Linda Morad, both longtime officials. Mm-hmm. Um, he was not the favorite in that race, although you wouldn't see either Morad or Cabral as an overwhelming favorite. Like, I don't think um, Mitchell would, would challenge Liz Warren because I just think she's the kind of um, beloved figure among the far left uh, or, or much of right. the progressive left that I don't think Mitchell would do that. No. But I think he might challenge uh, an Ed Markey. Uh, um, uh, a Bill Keating, maybe, maybe not. Keating probably is more likely to have worked closely with Mitchell than either of the senators. Uh, I don't know that... He would do that. Uh, my sense is that um, maybe he he will go for lieutenant governor with Seti Warren uh, or or someone else. Uh, yeah, it's he um, he's he's <clears throat> as you say he's an ambitious guy. He's also put himself in a position to be ready because you never know when suddenly something happens. And, and just look at over the years all the things that have changed in politics. Yeah. You you got to be ready to go. Whoever thought Scott Brown, for instance, was going to win. That special election, no one did. I don't think he did. And then suddenly he's a U.S. So all these things that change. Also, Mitchell can sit out. I mean, he can serve this last term as mayor. Uh, he can decide not to run for the four-year term, and then sit out. And then in two years, maybe the political landscape changes, mm-hmm. and he's got 
So he had $600,000. Maybe he spent 50000 75000 this last, maybe even 100000 He still has 500000 mm -hmm. uh, Has another and play more where that came yeah, from. Yeah, and he has um, uh, an ability to raise money in Boston from mm -hmm. both his own career there and his wife's career. Right. Uh, for those who don't know, Annie is a... Um, uh, the head of the the young woman's breast cancer unit at Dana yeah, Farber, very talented woman, a very talented woman, impressive woman. Uh, so uh, he can set out. Yeah, it's he he's in a nice position politically. Mm -hmm. He's in a nice position politically, which is different than he was maybe five weeks ago when after that was it five weeks ago the preliminary. Yeah, I have to say if Mitchell had lost, if Mitchell had well if they'd lost his career would be over. Right. If he had won by anything less than six seven percent. I think uh, it would be hard for him to argue that I'm a really strong candidate. He got the win he needed. Twenty percent is a is a good win in any universe. Like you know, sure. Um, all right, well, so, I'm Chris McCarthy. This is Sunday brunch. We're, we're talking with Jack Splain here. We're going to take a we'll take a quick call here. Uh, good morning. You're live in WBSM. Yes, a couple of questions on elections. Your previous. All right, listen. That's that's my buddy Ferris. Well, that's not Ferris. That's Vanessa. <laughs> who, who, who? When, when, when Ferris shaves, he sees Vanessa, see. right? So uh, you recognize uh, Vanessa quickly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I suspected. Um, it's a private number. They were hanging on there. Okay. So I love him, but we're, we're doing something local here, and I know what he, he wants to take in his own direction. That's cool sure. sometimes, but not right now. So we have um, John Mitchell wins big. Of course, it wasn't a lot of voters that came out. 25%. Yeah. So two years ago, we had 7% in the primary and 22% in the final. This year, we had 9% in the primary and 25% in the final. So, I mean, there's a lot of um, skepticism about New Bedford's voting rolls. Right. There's supposed to be 54,000 registered voters in a city of 95,000. Right. Uh, I don't know. Right. So... They say it was 25%. Maybe it was really more like 35%, mm -hmm. uh, which is still not great. But, you know, uh, it's not – it could be worse. It could be worse. He he did well all across the city, I, I think. I believe yeah, he, uh, so those precincts – the only precincts – he lost um, eight precincts. Okay. Uh, he lost all the precincts in Ward 4, although much more narrowly than in um, the primary. Right. And he lost two precincts in Ward 3. Um I, I thought they were the precincts next to the airport. They were not. Right. He lost, which he did lose in the he did lose in the primary. primary. He, did not, he won them uh, in the final election. He also won the precincts in Ward Six and Two that he lost in the primary. Right. He lost the Hayden McFadden precinct, which is a very low uh, precinct now, um, mainly a Latino. Oh, it has right. it has the warm side of Mills in it where where um, Hugh, Hugh Dunn, Dunn lives. lives. Right. But uh, other than that, it's a Latino precinct, and um, he lost the precinct that is, is an L shaped precinct that goes from the high school. Uh, into around the old Kempton School, you know mm -hmm. that area in the midsection yes. of, the, of the city. He, um, I thought was Ward Two was interesting because he he did really well in Ward Two. Yeah, won them all. Won them all. He he had some, and of course that's where Maria Giesta. So people went in and voted for both John Mitchell and Maria Giesta. Yes, they did. You know, and those are also areas where there some of the part of Ward Two has some, has a lot of crime. It's one of the areas we think about. At least it's got yeah. more crime than, than say, like south, south of Brooklyn Park. Uh, yeah, but they but they voted overwhelmingly for him. Where I thought one of the issues that could affect the mayor was crime. It did. It, I mean, yeah. he, he he won Ward Two more narrowly than he won places like Ward One and Ward Five. Right. Uh, um, uh, the the tip of Ward Six, that peninsula, he won big, um, and he won it more narrowly. Uh, in fact. Think, in fact, I think he lost one of those precincts in the preliminary. Um, he, it, it, when I look at the numbers from the final, it was just very clear to me that he just did not do anything in no. the preliminary. And so even in terms of calling up his own voters and, right. and saying, get out. And so uh, uh, maybe he wanted to see just how little he had to do in the, in the final. <laughs> and he found out. <laughs> well, I, I will say this, because I think the mayor, uh, you know, he's running the city. You, you delegate your stuff to your campaign team. I couldn't tell you who his campaign team was, but I think that that um, they let him down in the preliminary election. There's some They made some assumptions that didn't come out. Now, look, it's hindsight's 2020. It's easy. But by not really doing anything in the preliminary election, they suddenly gave Charlie Perry – a big boost. Yeah. It, who was his campaign team? I, I don't, I, you know, usually I know who the people are to call and stuff right. like that. You know, um, toward the end, he had some surrogates that were out there on, 
on social media. But nobody who was really um, a campaign manager that I ever identified. No, neither did I. No, neither did I. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. When we come back, we're going to have John Sapachetti give us his picks for the football. 